Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Philip Greenish. I'm Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering. And it's my very great pleasure and honour uh, to welcome to the Academy this afternoon, uh, firstly, the Right Honourable Prime Minister of the Republic of Kenya, Raila Odinga, MP, his fellow MPs from the Republic of Kenya, the Prime Minister's daughter, Mrs. Rosemary Odinga, the Kenyan High Commissioner to the UK, His Excellen Excellency Ifram Gari, and the Rwandan High Commissioner, and of course, all of you, you're most welcome. We're here to celebrate the launch of the Africa-UK Engineering for Development Partnership. It's a program that the Royal Academy of Engineering is immensely proud to be part of. It's led by the Africa Engineers Forum, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the Institution of Civil Engineers, with strong support from Engineers Against Poverty. The program brings together the professional engineering community in the UK and Sub-Saharan Africa in a capacity-building partnership. It's made possible by the generous donations from the Anglo-American Group Foundation, the David and Elaine Potter Foundation, and Schlumberger, and we gratefully acknowledge their support. Well, during this afternoon's proceedings, you'll hear more about the work of the partnership from Professor Peter Guthrie, who leads the Academy's contribution to the partnership, and Professor Paul Jowett, President of the Institution of Civil Engineers. And most importantly, you will hear why engineering matters for Africa from our distinguished keynote speaker, the Right Honourable Raila Odinga. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Professor Peter Guthrie. Peter is a fellow of this academy, and he's head of the Centre for Sustainable Development at the University of Cambridge. Peter is the first professor in engineering for sustainable development in the UK, having held that post since the year 2000. He spent many years working in Africa with a role in the creation of Red R, a charity that provides engineers and other personnel uh, to relief agencies in disasters. So Peter, if I could ask you to come and say a few words. Thank you, Philip. Prime Minister, High Commissioners, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen. I was uh, I, pleased to be part of the African launch uh, of the Africa-UK Engineering for Development <coughs> initiative uh, in South Africa in March this year. And so it's particularly pleasing that I'm able to also be here to report back on that very constructive meeting uh, and to be able to be, uh, report on our progress. Eleven countries in Africa were represented at that meeting, uh, including a prominent delegation, of course, from Kenya. And our partners that Philip mentioned uh, at that meeting uh, are the Africa Engineers Forum and Dawi Bota, who isn't able to be here today, uh, asked that a, a, meeting sh a, a message should be conveyed to you. He says... We would like to extend our sincere appreciation and congratulations to Dr. Hayatun Salem and her colleagues at the Royal Academy, the Institution of Civil Engineers, and other partners, as well as to the generous sponsors for facilitating this wonderful initiative. And I think that we have an opportunity in this for the Royal Academy to really express and, and contribute positively to the increase of engineering capacity in Africa. Uh, there are a number of workshops planned in the coming months, uh, and we hope also to uh, better our knowledge of the degree of capacity that exists in sub-Saharan African countries uh, with a, a, a study uh, later on. Uh, I have real hopes that the Royal Academy will be able to contribute in a way uh, to Africa's engineering uh, capacity building and thereby to Africa's development uh, through the sort of uh, contributions that the Academy is able to make on an international stage. But it will only be done with the cooperation and the engagement by our African partners, including the AEF. And I look forward very much to working more closely with the different institutions around Africa in the years to come. 
Having some experience in my own career of living and working in Africa, I'm particularly pleased to be part of this initiative, which I'm, I'm confident will contribute to improved opportunities to increase engineering capacity across the African continent and thereby assist in overall development. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you very much for those words. Uh, I'll now introduce uh, Professor Paul Jarrett. In addition to being the current president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, Paul is Professor of Civil Engineering Systems and Executive Director of the Scottish Institute of Sustainable Technology at Heriot Watt University. Paul has a long-standing interest in and commitment to engineering and international development, and Paul has made this the focus of his term as ICE President. Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Philip, and good, good afternoon, Prime Minister and High Commissioner and fellow engineers and, and guests. Um, as Philip mentioned, I have made international development that one of the focus of, of my year as president. The other one has been the role of, of young engineers and the role of infrastructure, and they all very neatly combine in this uh, particular activity. <clears throat> because as we know... It's the lack of access to basic infrastructure that is at the root of world poverty and the tragedies associated with it. And uh, resolving that will require young engineers and the assistance of the engineering community uh, worldwide. A number of years ago, I was invited by the then president of the Institution of Civil Engineers to look at what the role of engineers might be in the 21st century. And and society's expectations of that. And the inquiry was uh, conducted with the title Engineering Without Frontiers. And during the course of that, we had um, a meeting, and I'd been in correspondence with Calestus Juma, who many of you will know and is a fellow of the academy here. And I got this very interesting little email back from him, in which it had the first line said, Engineering Without Frontiers question mark, and the next line said, try frontiers without engineering, also known as sub-Saharan Africa. And it was really this um, issue of the limiting factor uh, in many cases is a lack of access to basic infrastructure. And if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, the first six of them, things to do with maternal health, uh, lack of education, gender equality, AIDS, um, poverty. Uh, there's another two and I've forgotten them, but they'll come to me. They're all actually tied up with the lack of access to basic infrastructure. And that if you can deal with that, then a lot of these other tragedies would be avoided. The seventh one is about the environmental limits within which we have to operate. And the eighth one is about building partnerships to help us deliver them. And in many ways, the, the partnership we're here to celebrate today is an embodiment of that eighth millennium development goal through which, with luck, we will start to deliver on the first six. And it will cover everything, we believe, from capacity building to issues to do with curriculum development, um, to do with the training of engineers and so on. And as part of my presidency this year, we've recruited uh, a band of 12 young engineers as, to work with me as apprentices to look at what are, what are the, the, the tools that an engineer needs to address international development. And so for, for me, this year has been very enjoyable seeing that scheme come to fruition at the same time as the, the launch of this particular partnership and a number of other developments all to do with international development, young engineers, and infrastructure. And we're so grateful to have been able to work with the Academy, with the African Engineers Forum, and with Engineers Against Poverty, and other partner institutions to make this a reality. And we're obviously very grateful, too, to our sponsors that have enabled us to do it. And to have this UK launch uh, here at the Academy in the presence of the Prime Minister of Kenya is 
really a great privilege for us, and I think it will give us the impetus with which we can all move forward and start to make real progress to deliver the UN Millennium Development Goals. Because let us be clear that the provision of basic infrastructure has never had a more important social, economic, envir environmental, or economic imperative. And as engineers, now is the time that we need to deliver on that. And now is the time, and it starts today. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you very much. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, the Right Honourable Prime Minister of the Republic of Kenya, Raila Odinga. As both engineer and statesman, the Prime Minister is uniquely placed to talk about the significance of engineering to Africa's development. And we are greatly honoured that he's made this trip to be with us here today. Raila Odinga was born on the 7th of January 1945 in Maseno, Kenya. Following early schooling in Kenya, he went on to complete his studies in Germany, graduating with a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the Magdeburg College of Advanced Technology. He returned to Kenya and in, May, in May 1970 and joined the University of Nairobi as a tutorial fellow in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. In 1974, he joined the Kenya Bureau of Standards as deputy director. In 1982, there was a coup attempt by officers of the Kenya Air Force, and Mr. Odinga's political record led to his arrest, along with many other civilians. He was detained without trial for six years, only to be re-detained twice more in quick succession, thereafter for a further two years, and he was finally released in 1991. Mr. Odinga left the country and spent a brief period of exile in Norway. In December 1992, he was elected MP for the Langata constituency in Nairobi. And in two 2001, uh, he initiated rapprochement with the ruling party, Kanu, and eventually entered into a merger of Kanu and NDP to form new Kanu, of which he was elected Secretary General. He was also appointed to the cabinet. He was later instrumental in forming the National Rainbow Coalition, and following the coalition's success in the subsequent elections, he was appointed Minister for Roads, Public Works, and Housing. Mr. Odinga contested the 2007 presidential election on the ticket of the Orange Democratic Movement. Subsequent to this, he entered into a power-sharing agreement with Mwai Kibaki. Mr. Odinga then became Prime Minister while Mr. Kibaki became president. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the right honourable Raila Odinga, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by introducing a few of the gentlemen who are with me here uh, this evening. Honorable John Bandy is a member of parliament for a constituency called Gwasi in Kenya. Next is Honorable Charles Onyansha, another member of parliament for Kenya. I have uh, Professor Hiroyuki Kino, an economist and advisor. Engineer Michael Kamau is the permanent secretary uh, the Ministry of Roads in Kenya, but it's also the Registrar of Engineers in Kenya. Then uh, I have uh, uh, Salim Loan. Salim Loan is um, uh, a journalist by profession, he's an editor, he's been working with the United Nations, um, but he's now retired and a consultant in Kenya. Then, of course, uh, the High Commissioner, Ephraim uh, uh, Gari, who is resident here in Kenya. Let me begin by saying how honored I feel to have been invited to come and uh, help in launching this partnership. I'm also delighted 
to want to be talking to engineers mainly. I'm usually used to talking to an audience which is predominantly lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know that uh, lawyers like to refer to themselves as learned friends. And they believe that they're the only ones who are learned. <laughs> and I keep on asking if you are learned, what about, about us? Um, but I was told that uh, the word learned uh, 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 had its origin in those old days of Socrates and uh, Chimedes and so on, when people used to learn very many different professions. You'd be a profession, uh, you'd be a philosopher, you'd be uh, a medical doctor, and so on, and then eventually you'll crown it, an engineer crown it up by being a lawyer. And that's why they were referred to as learned friends. So it is not quite right these days for one profession to arrogate to themselves the title of learned friends because <laughs> <laughs> they have not learned these other professions. Our engineers are generally very humble. Earlier on, I was told that um, my position is unique, that you have an engineer who is a prime minister, uh, that this has not happened in this country. But then I said that in China, most ministers are engineers. That probably is the reason why China is moving at that pace in terms of the development, because they have put engineering forward. Um, let me uh, begin first by s s saying that um, I'm an uh, Afro-optimist. Afro-optimist as opposed to Afro-pessimist. Uh, but I'm not Afro-centrist. In other words, um, I belong to the school that believes that uh, Africa is not a lost cause. Uh, those are the Afro-optimists as opposed to Afro-pessimists, those who think that Africa is a lost cause. But I believe very strongly in the ability of the African people to spearhead the process of development of Africa. But um, I don't believe uh, that Africa is better than other parts of the world. I only believe that Africa is equal to other parts of the world. Um, now, I want to say that with the uh, benefit of hindsight, it is self-evident that the social and economic transformation in Africa that we are all launched for will, cannot be attained without effective application of science and technology in general and engineering in particular. But Africa did not just start by not applying engineering. Uh, African engineering is one of the oldest in the world. Africa is also now recognized as the cradle of mankind. It has been proven through research, uh, archaeological research, that uh, the oldest species of humanoid fossil has been found in Africa, to be more specific, in the eastern part of Africa. So I can say without fear of contradiction that Africa is the cradle of mankind. <coughs> Secondly, the African steel making is one of the oldest in the world. They were making steel and bronze in Africa when they were still using stone here in Europe. Then you can see relics of African engineering. I've just come from Cairo. Uh, where I was guest of President Mubarak. And we went and visited the, the museum, the Egyptian museum. There you'll find the mummies there. And then you go to the pyramids and you um, marvel at the art of engineering in those years at that time. Those were real Africans and they were applying engineering in thousands of BCs. If you go to Mali, you'll find the University of 
Timbuktu, and the oldest university in the world. So in those days, the Africans of that era applied engineering for development. That's why Africa developed much more than the rest of the world at that time. It is, uh, I want to say that uh, it is therefore one of the tragedies of the post-colonial Africa that the embodiment of the value of science in our society was neglected in our development agenda. Thus, I want to applaud the UK-Africa Engineering for Development Partnership that we are launching today. I thank truthfully the UK Royal Academy of Engineering for the leadership that has brought this most valuable initiative to fruition. Given of the importance of this Africa-UK partnership, I consider it an exceptional honor that I have been invited to address this distinguished uh, gathering today to celebrate its commencement. I'm extremely delighted, not only because I value this partnership, but also because I am first and foremost an engineer, as I've been told. I studied mechanical engineering at the University of Magdeburg, and then after returning home with a Master's of Science, I started my career as an academic, like many of you, taking up the post of research fellowship at the University of Nairobi. I taught theory of mechanics, engineering design, and production technology in the mechanical engineering department. I then moved on to practice what I taught. I built a business in manufacturing which is manufacturing pressure vessels, heat and steam receivers, steam boilers, and liquefied petroleum gas cylinders. Uh, I bought this machinery from an Asian who had been expelled from Uganda by the then brutal regime of Idi Amin. And he had uh, removed this machinery and brought them to Nairobi. So I bought this machinery from him as second hand, and using this and scrap material, I constructed a factory in Nairobi, which has grown to become a successful enterprise that is called East Africa Spectra Limited. Um, then thereafter, I joined the Kenya Bureau of Standards at its inception as an engineer, and uh, I became its deputy director. Of course, as has already been explained, destiny has compelled me to the world of politics. So these days, I'm um, engineering politics. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, of course, I, I do share and fully understand the opportunities which advance in engineering and in the entirety of science and technology provides to humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to begin my remarks here with a bit of history that illustrates the importance of engineering in economic development in Africa. The story relates to the construction of the line, of the railway line currently known as the Kenya-Uganda Railways. Arguably, the first major engineering project in Eastern Africa. On December 11th, 1895, engineer George Whitehouse arrived in Mombasa, abroad SS Ethiopia, to start the construction of the Uganda Railway. <coughs> On the 20th of December, 1901, engineer uh, Preston, completed the construction when the railway line reached Lake Victoria. His wife, Florence, symbolically drove the last key into the line at the lake port, which was thereafter renamed Port Florence after her. 
This was indeed the railway in the wilderness of Africa, built at a time when every service required was provided by the builders themselves. They provided laborers imported from India, water supply, health services, and even food rations. The famous man-eaters of Savo, those are the lions, did not make the work any easier. They kept on uh, uh, marauding and taking some of the technicians as food. This line was initially described as the Lunatic Express in the House of Commons. One member of parliament said uh, these immortal words. What it will cost, no words can express. What is its object, no brain can sub uh, suppose. Where it will start, no one can guess. Where it is going to, nobody knows. What is, is, is use of, none can conjecture. What it will carry, none can define. And in spite of George Cousin's superior lecture, it clearly is not but a lunatic line. These words notwithstanding, this project was a major success, and it continues to be one of the greatest achievements of technology transfer in the history of Africa. It took these people five years to construct this railway line, which was 1,000 kilometers in length, with those crude, the crude technology that was then available at that time, in a very difficult terrain. So ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, however, this marvel of engineering turned into some old museum piece, <coughs> as President Yoweri Museveni of Uganda likes to refer to it. This is because the railways were not kept up to date. The railways were terribly mismanaged, both financially and technically. It became another victim of corruption. As a result, we have had to rely on roads for transportation. To make things even worse, our road network was left to decay. Thus, it takes extraordinarily long to transport goods, and it is very costly. The transport cost absorbs about 40% of export value of some of our agricultural products. It takes just as long to transport a car from Japan to Mombasa as to transport it from Mombasa to Kampala. The lack of reliable rail network, therefore, has put our industries and agriculture on tremendous competitive disadvantage, hindering our economic development. It took the British, as I've said, five years to construct this line, and since that time, 47 years later, we have not added a single inch to that line. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa is the richest continent in the world, endowed with abundant natural resources. Oil, copper, iron ore, coffee, bauxite, cotton, just to name but a few. Yet Africa is the poorest continent, with a vast majority of its population living under absolute poverty. It is a paradox and the richest continent in, the, in terms of resources is also the poorest. But I want to say that this paradox is due to corruption and mismanagement. The discovery of oil helped Norway to substantially raise the living standards of its people. In contrast, Nigeria is served with poverty and conflict despite its huge oil wealth. Natural resources has been a curse in most African countries, 
This is because of corruption. The lack of value addition explains the rest of this paradox. Africa should not remain exporters of raw materials. We must process them at home to add value. We must use our natural resources for industrialization. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kenyans uh, have learned a lesson. In Vision 2030, which is a blueprint which is aimed at transforming the Kenyan economy from a third world to a middle income economy by the year 2030. Science, technology, and innovation is featured as a key element for building the foundations for socioeconomic transformation. Vision 2030 envisages Kenya to become a knowledge-led economy by A, strengthening our institutions of learning and enterprise, B, building highly skilled human resources, and C, effective use of information technology. One of the flagship projects of Vision 2030 is to build the Trans-Eastern African Railways. The railways will start from Lamu, in a historic coastal town in southeastern Kenya, go up north all the way to Ethiopia, and then cut across west to Sudan and Uganda. We shall build this with the state-of-the-art technology. We shall make it a masterpiece of modern engineering. And the consultancy work has already been commissioned. Some of you may say that this is a lunatic express of the 21st century. We shall prove those skeptics wrong. Africa needs vision. Africa needs leadership. And Africa needs ambition. Equally important, we shall build a trans-African information superhighway. We have already completed fiber optic cables. Three of them have landed at the port of Mombasa and have been connected to Nairobi. We have already rolled out the network throughout the country. We are now at the stage of setting up uh, um, e-villages in our country. Even as we speak of this vital role of engineers in bringing about infrastructural transformation in Africa, we must not forget that simple application of the basic knowledge of science and technology are equally vital. It is these basics that can tremendously improve the quality of life for ordinary Africans. Providing safe water through a simple purification device, drying maize in a simple warehouse, and using lead lamps instead of kerosene are some of the examples. Science, technology, and engineering are equally needed to address other major challenges Africa currently faces, including the menace of tropical diseases and climate change. In Kenya and elsewhere in Africa, it is urgent to restore our forests, develop renewable energy, and strengthen disaster risk management. Ladies and gentlemen, the UK-Africa Engineering Partnership is poised to help Africa meet the, science, the challenges of scientific transformation. For example, the partnership could provide opportunities for African engineers to enhance their skills through joint venture initiatives with their overseas counterparts. This will significantly contribute to the development of the local engineering community in, the African, in Africa at large. In Kenya, we have a cadre of most capable engineers. The Engineers Registration Board, whose secretary is here, Engineer Kamau, currently has a total enrollment of over 8,200 
among them 200 consulting engineers, 2,500 registered engineers, and 5,500 graduate engineers. The Institution of Engineers of Kenya is an ideal candidate for collaboration in this area. Well, 8,200 is not a big number, but you need to know that I was number 620 <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to be registered. Another possibility would be to offer exchange programs for graduate and undergraduate students that target both scholarships and real work experience. In Kenya, there is a faculty or school of engineering at all our major public universities. You must also remember that it is crucial to nurture scientific and innovative mind when brains are young and when curiosities abound. I thus call for an establishment of technology investment funds that would help in integrating teaching of science and technology through our schools, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The fund would help introduce innovative learning and assist in improving the quality of learning and institution and instructions. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I would stress that without higher education and research institutions providing a critical mass of skilled and educated people, no country can engender genuine and sustainable development. Without it, the least developed countries cannot reduce the gap separating them from the industrial developed countries. Indeed, Africa will not be able to catch up with the developed countries as long as it imports second-hand technologies. We will therefore need to leapfrog the advanced countries in science and technology in the areas where Africa has comparative advantage. We do not need to reinvent the wheels. Africa requires transfer of most advanced technologies. What Africa needs is a help in capacity building. Through sharing knowledge, cooperating in capacity building, and transfer, transferring new technologies, we can get rid of the technological divide. Sustainable development is, without doubt, a shared goal throughout the African continent. I believe firmly that the Africa Engineering UK, Africa UK Engineering for Development Partnership will contribute immensely to achieving this goal. I started by saying that I'm an Afro optimist. And um, I conclude by saying that uh, I see that uh, Africa has a great potential to develop and to catch up with the rest of the world. Uh, Africa is where it is today because of the way in which it has been run for the last 50 years since independence. And uh, we have kept on lamenting about our colonial past. My position has been that we should forget about that and look forward. The solutions to our problems do not lie in where we've come from, but where we want to go. Because I say that even the United States of America was once upon a time a colony of the United Kingdom. Even China was one time also a colony. India was one of the jewel colonies of the United Kingdom, <coughs> and so on. So we say that let us forget the past and move on uh, with the work of developing Africa. Fortunately, uh, there have been changes in the last 15 to 20 years. Reforms have taken place. Uh, as a result of the struggles of the African people to change uh, regimes. Regimes that brought independence quickly transformed themselves into single party dictatorships that did not allow room for development. 
that was also the era of the Cold War, when a lot of aid was being pumped in Africa as part of the Cold War. So, so long as an African leader said that he was an ally of the West in the war against communism, nobody cared how he was managing his country. He continued to receive a lot of money. That's why a lot of aid was pumped into Africa without much to show for it. Most of it found its way into private bank accounts in Switzerland and many other places. So you find that many African countries today are saddled with huge debts, but with very little to show for where that, that, that money went to. Um, it was because of this, that is how we created the African big men. That's how we created the Idi Amin Dadas of this world. You could lynch Ugandans, you become a white man's burden, being carried by Englishmen, and still could be also elected as the chairman of the OAU. That's how we created Jen Badel Gubokasa of Central African Empire, Mobutu Sisiseko of this world, um, Kamuzu Banda of Malawi, just to mention but a few. But with the fall of Berlin Wall, the, the wind of change that blew over the European continent also began to blow on the African continent, bringing down the single party regimes and military dictatorships. And in their place, new democratic regimes have come up. This has uh, set in, in motion a new process of development in the African continent. Over the last 10 years, most of African countries have realized an average growth of 5% per annum. And the results are there to be seen. So it's only the last two years because of the global meltdown that this progress has somehow been reversed. But already the trend is continuing. So Africa is now the frontier of hope. I believe very strongly that the 21st century will eventually turn out to be the African century. But this is only when Africa is going to apply technology to its development. And engineering must drive the development and growth in the African continent. I believe truly very strongly in this. With this, so many remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I want to declare the Africa-UK Engineering Partnership for Sustainable Development officially launched. Thank you. Uh, well, Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed for uh, a truly inspirational uh, speech in which uh, I think you have presented us uh, with a compelling case for the importance of uh, engineering in developing uh, the capacity of uh, uh, countries in, in Africa to improve their own quality of life uh, and in the economic <coughs> development of, uh, of Africa as a whole. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister has very kindly agreed to take questions on engineering uh, in Africa. Uh, there are roving uh, microphones, so if you could please wait until the microphone has reached you, and then if you could give your name and your affiliation, please, before... Uh, asking your question of the Prime Minister. So, the floor is open. We have a question at the back. In fact, we have two questions at the back and then one just slightly in front. Uh, thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm Colin Pritchard from the University of Edinburgh um, and I have uh, many colleagues, uh, research colleagues in Kenya. One of our concerns is that um, uh, engineers may not be sufficiently engaged in rather basic questions like, and I give an example, the efficiency of charcoal production, uh, an industry that employs half a million people in Kenya, but um, which is endangering the survival of the relic forests in, uh, in, the, in the country. And our, one of our concerns is how to get 
much more efficient production into national policy. Do you have any comment to make on that, sir? Well, yes. Um, I, I, uh, first, I agree with you fully that um, we uh, need to uh, win our people from the use of uh, wood fuel or charcoal as a, a source of energy. Um, but um, I don't share the view that engineers are not fully engaged in uh, alternative uh, production of, of charcoal. Um, just shortly before I left, there was uh, uh, an interview with uh, uh, a self-made engineer who has invented um, a very um, ingenious way of uh, producing charcoal using uh, waste uh, materials uh, like uh, pepper mixing with a little bit of soil and so on. And this being promoted uh, by uh, an institution which is local in, in Kenya, funded by, by government. So as a government, we are really promoting the use of alternative source of energy, uh, renew, new and renewable sources of energy is an area which is receiving priority attention. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's a desk in the office of the Prime Minister coordinating these efforts. Hi, Prime Minister. Um, I, my question um, surrounds more or less what you mentioned was the key problem affecting African development um, in science and technology and in other areas. You mentioned corruption several times. And I'd just like to ask, um, how are you planning to tackle um, this, this problem that has um, affected our development, sir? Well, um, they say that corruption is one of the oldest professions. Because <laughs> it's also in the Bible. If you read the story of somebody called Ananias. He was sold the piece of land but retained some money. Um, corruption actually has ex existed for many years, and in most societies, even in this country, uh, it is there. Uh, e even uh, in, in Europe, uh, in China, elsewhere. Um, the, the difference is what is done when it is discovered. Uh, there are places where if a corruption is discovered, then action is taken immediately against the offenders. Um, so what we are f talking about is institutionalized corruption, where corruption is uh, tolerated, and, and because that then makes it grow to the levels that we know. So uh, we, for example, in Kenya, are uh, very determined to uh, uh, eradicate or reduce uh, the influence of corruption. And here, we distinguish between mega corruption and petty corruption. The two are not as equal. Uh, the petty corruption are corruptions in which, which people get involved in in order to make ends meet. If, for example, their income is less than their expectations or their commitment and so on, they will get involved with this. Um, this kind of corruption uh, and is also as a, as, a, uh, as a result of poverty in society. Uh, it's dealt with basically by improving the living conditions of the people in the society. Mega corruption is the of corruption within the, the, is the systemic corruption committed by senior officials in government in collusion with the private sector. Because as, the, as it thinks, as, as, as it is, it takes two to tango. You have the private sector that also is engaged in a brutal competition for government services and contracts and uh, to cut corners, they bribe officials in government. So we are saying that we must deal with both of them. 
the, those who are in government and those who are in the private sector who also seek to bribe officials in government. And uh, we have in Kenya what we call the Kenya Anti-Corruption Commission, which is charged with the responsibility with dealing with these cases of corruption. Uh, we have several other institutions, uh, some of them in the office of the Prime Minister, like the Inspect Inspectorate of State Co uh, Corporations, dealing with the Kwangos. Uh, we have an uh, efficiency monitoring unit in government, which also carry out investigations when uh, 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 matters are reported. But the most important institution in fight against corruption is the civil society. Because that, and the public generally. If the members of the public are empowered, the media is, is uh, vibrant, uh, the, the civil society is strong, then you've got several whistleblowers in the country. And once they're whistleblowers, first it acts as a deterrent, but also once the, the information is out there, investigations are carried out and prosecutions are done. This is the best way to deal with this uh, vice of corruption. Uh, there's a lady at uh, the back. Okay. Um, my name is Blessing Gwena. I work for ACOM as a graduate engineer. Um, my question is for the panel. Um, how do you see the role of private-public um, partnerships in the development of African infrastructure given the lack of funding and finance on the continent? If we could start with uh, you, Prime Minister. And then... Yes, um, we uh, in Kenya have uh, actually come up with uh, an act of parliament uh, to regulate this public-private partnership. We have uh, recognized that uh, public funding alone <coughs> is inadequate uh, for development. That is necessary to try to attract private funding uh, in development, particularly in the field of infrastructure. Uh, we, for example, are now inviting private sector to partner in road construction. We are already engaged in the first concession, uh, which will end up with the toll road in the country. In the field of uh, energy generation, for example, we have uh, what we call the IPPs, the independent power producers. We liberalized the sector where now we separated generation from transmission and distribution. Now we've also separated <coughs> transmission from distribution. So we now have three different institutions, the generators, the transmission company, and the distribution company. Uh, private sector is allowed to uh, apply and generate, set up generation units and sell uh, the power to the national grid. Um, there are several other similar projects like those where we, have, we encourage public-private uh, uh, partnership and this is regulated through the have mentioned an act of parliament. Paul, do you wish to add? Uh, yes, yes, please. Um, I think we have to be careful that we don't end up advocating one model fits all in terms of PPP, and it will depend on the local circumstances. But I'm absolutely in no doubt that multi sector partnerships are the way to achieve this. The, in terms of the utilities, for example, say water utilities, there are very few international PLCs who've got the spare finances to invest in, in African water companies. But they do have some of the skills. So if we can get a combination of, uh, of local finance and a, lo and a combination of inter international development aid finance or even international private finance, coupled with some skills from the private sector, coupled with some local skills, coupled with the community to make sure that the transparency is there that the Prime Minister talked about, because there have been examples of um, PPP of sorts in 
in uh, developing economies which have catastrophically failed to deliver. And, and part of it has been the fact the local community doesn't really trust what has been set up and they've been right not to. So I, I think it is actually vitally important to do that. And I can see lots of different models whereby that could be achieved. Uh, and ironically, some of it comes back to the partnership that we've launched today because um, this is all about capacity building. So there, in my view, there are two things that are important. What, there is no point in, if you like, selling off the, the infrastructure because to a certain extent that's the only asset that some of these local communities have got. So to actually give it to a private company seems a, a grave mistake. But the, uh, and if we can develop the engineering capacity to maintain and develop those locally, that will be good. But the other important thing is that part of this agenda is about improving the capacity of professional engineering institutions. And the Prime Minister spoke a few moments ago about the need to develop with corruption. And of course, what professional institutions, professional engineering institutions have is a code of ethics and a code of conduct. And which is vitally important that we get those involved in the delivery of infrastructure to be qualified locally within a professional institution bound by a professional code of conduct. So I think a partnership arrangement is good in all sorts of ways, both in terms of delivery, economics, but also in terms of moral purpose and ethics. Uh, there are lots of models, of course, of public and private partnerships. There are very many different uh, ways in which it can be achieved. But I think the fact that uh, many African countries have been uh, uh, relatively slow in picking these up uh, gives them an advantage of being able to learn from history. And I'm slightly gloomier than uh, Paul is about uh, the performance of many PPPs around the world uh, where uh, the private engagement has been uh, less impressive seen on a long-term scale for the country concerned. And I think uh, there, are, there is plenty of lessons to be learned that could be built into the safeguards and the, particularly the allocation of risk uh, associated with uh, these uh, partnerships which countries might enter into uh, might have entered into previously rather unwittingly. Now there is precedent and there are definitely lessons to be learned. So I also think there are some utilities which uh, are the responsibility of public authorities and it's difficult to transfer those responsibilities to the private sector. A question from the back, sir. Uh, my name is Ayo, and I run a product development consultancy here in London. Uh, we've been talking about value addition, and I just wondered whether there is any kind of uh, strategy for uh, industrial design, product development, education, as well as transferring knowledge to the SME sector, because these, these are sort of allied disciplines that are key uh, to adding value for export and also leveraging the Kenyan brand. Um, I'll be grateful if you could respond to that question. Thank you. Yes, um, we recognize the importance of SMEs uh, in the economy because uh, this SMEs which will help us to build uh, a middle class in our country. And without uh, a vibrant middle class, it's really impossible for a country to really take off economically. So we are promoting the growth of uh, SMEs in our country. One, we're addressing the crucial issues of capital, access to capital, has been one of the major handicaps of the growth of SMEs in, in our country. And uh, there are several packages that are available uh, uh, for uh, capital for the SMEs. Secondly, also, uh, capacity building, training of uh, uh, the people who, uh, I mean, the potential uh, 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 investors in the field of SMEs is also available at uh, various institutions in the country. Um, so we are really trying to develop uh, capacity, but then there must be the entrepreneurship spirit 
uh, which is also very, very crucial, the ability to take risks uh, in order to venture into uh, uh, this kind of enterprise is, is very, very important. Again, we are also trying to, to train people in, in, in that direction. I'm David Phillips. I'm president-elect of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, we have a project running in Africa, which is called the Pan-African Chemical Network. Uh, and it has really very similar aims to, to what is being launched today. Uh, it's capacity building. It focuses on, on health and water. And it's sponsored, in our case, by Unilever and Syngenta, amongst others. And it just, it's a question, really, or a comment, really, for the panel. Uh, since we have such similar aims, and one of our hubs is the University of Nairobi Chemistry Department, in what way can we uh, collaborate to get the maximum benefit out of these two, two uh, sets of efforts? Uh, should that be done locally within Kenya, or should we be doing it here in London? Uh, how best can we collaborate, is the question. I'd like if the Prime Minister a break and ask Peter to kick off. Yeah. I'm always nervous about new initiatives because as soon as you launch anything, you discover that it's already been thought of at least five times before. And I think collaboration at both ends, obviously, is going to make sense. But I think collaboration at this end is absolutely essential, uh, if only because uh, there can be great confusion about what everybody is trying to achieve in a narrow way when actually our, <laughs> our aims, and I'm sure your aims, are very broad in, in your what you would regard as indicators of success, which is an increase in the level of capacity locally. And perhaps one of the messages that uh, we're very, well, I'm particularly keen, I'm not sure I have uh, my colleagues complete backing on this, uh, is the idea that this is not a transfer of uh, knowledge, expertise and awareness, but an exchange. And one of our greatest challenges, I think, is to redesign the way in which engineers, engineering curriculums in this country are designed so that there's an international dimension to the graduating engineer that gives a respectability to the sort of work that we seek for work in Africa so that engineers from Africa who come to our universities can see that what their priorities are are included in our curricula. And I think, you know, those would be, that is a very sort of similar language that I'm sure you're talking in your project. So, we need to talk. And I think we have one final question. Is all we have time for now from here, yeah, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Manyanga. I work for Howard Crow Group. But my question is uh, more as a citizen of uh, the SADAC or as an African. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm quite pleased that we now have an engineer within the um, SADAC heads of states and government or the AU as well. Now, I wanted to know if within the structures of SADAC or within the structures of the AU, you have uh, bodies that are addressing engineering issues or giving engineering advice as an engineer yourself. Thank you. Well, um, uh, I don't know that they do have within SADAC. You know, SADAC, of course, works very closely with COMESA. And... Um, I know that uh, uh, within a commerce there's collaboration uh, among the universities uh, in those countries and also with, within SADAC itself uh, in, in the field of, of science and technology. Uh, the various faculties have um, um, uh, a kind of an arrangement for collaboration and uh, uh, also sharing of information. And um, this information, of course, is also shared with the government, uh, various governments. So I know that um, whenever there are uh, meetings, uh, usually uh, delegations that do, do go there are accompanied usually by uh, expert, by technical experts. Uh, and their advice usually informs the uh, discussions or the issues of infrastructure. For example, 
when we are talking about uh, interconnectivity of uh, 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 transmission lines within the, the region, like uh, the, the southern power pool and eastern African region, uh, the kind of connectivity is the technical details are first discussed by the experts before they come to the politicians for final decision making. Whether it is uh, the uh, interconnectivity in terms of highways, uh, again, or, or what we call the uh, corridors within the, the region, again, uh, that is informed by uh, experts, the, the viabilities of most of, of those, those projects. So, yes, decisions are not just political. They are also scientific and technical. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're, we're now out of time, so it's uh, to me to thank uh, our speakers and especially uh, the Prime Minister for their contributions this afternoon. Uh, but I would also uh, like to thank uh, the very distinguished members of uh, Prime Minister's delegation uh, who have uh, joined us this afternoon uh, and all of you for being here with us today and especially those who, who have asked uh, questions. Well, we've heard from the Prime Minister uh, a most powerful exposition of the significance of uh, engineering as an enabler uh, of development in Africa and beyond. Uh, and we're going to bear your wise words in mind, sir, as we take forward the Africa-UK uh, Engineering for Development Partnership. I have to say that I, too, uh, am an optimist. Uh, and after hearing uh, you this afternoon, Mr. Odinga, uh, I think we can be very optimistic for your country and also for the development uh, of Africa, uh, particularly with people like uh, Mr. Odinga now in uh, positions of authority uh, and responsibility. Uh, Prime Minister, we've been greatly honoured to have you with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed uh, for speaking to us uh, and for joining us this afternoon to launch our partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.